Um, I'll introduce uh, Ian McFarlane, who's um, he's a livestock consultant for Rural Solutions um, and uh, the coordinator of Sheep Connect. So I'll hand over to you, Ian, and you can give us a rundown on tonight's webinar. Okay, thanks, Philippa. Yeah, just a quick introduction, and we'll get into here from Peter, Peter Fielding, um, farmer from Yonkla, and uh, Colin Trangrove and Kim Perry. The issue has been quite widespread, particularly on Air Peninsula, and also had reports from uh, mid upper north as well. Um, haven't heard too much from the um, Mallee at this stage, but uh, estimate it's probably over 25,000 uh, sheep that have been affected across all the properties. So uh, quite a significant issue. We think we've got most of the answers tonight, uh, but uh, Pers of Biosecurity are doing um, some testing on farms. And so hopefully um, that will confirm what uh, we suspect is happening uh, this year. So I will hand it over to uh, back to Philippa and we'll uh, shortly hear from uh, Peter. Peter Fielding on the line here um, and uh, Pete's a, um, a merino breeder uh, up near uh, Peterborough. Um, and uh, I did notice that Peter was uh, very successful at the last Adelaide show and won, won the uh, Meet Merino Champion Fleece. So that's fantastic. Well done, Peter. Um, so being a Merino breeder, I apologise for the earlier slides. Um, but I'll hand over to him now and he can uh, share with us some of his experiences. Thanks, Peter. Yep, good evening all. Um, yeah, I'm Peter Fielding from yeah, Peterborough in the mid-north of South Australia. Uh, this time for the first year we, we planted the heap of vex that we planned to feed the lambs on after weaning. Um, so on about the, um, the 16th of the night, we had about 240 odd lambs, half were ewes and half were ram lambs. So we drafted them off and we introduced the ram lambs to the pure vex. And after we put them on the vex, my son came in on the motorbike and he said, Dad, that vex is um, pretty loaded with insects. I said, OK, yep. Yeah. And we didn't think much more of it. So that was on the, the 16th of the 9th we introduced them. And then on about um, yeah, 16 days later, on one of my inspections, I sort of thought I noticed a couple of the, the rams, the suspect fly strike. So I um, said to my son, go and round those rams up. There's a couple in there that are getting a bit dirty. So that was OK. He got them in and yeah, he, he crushed the ones that just had a couple of flies. There was only about two or three of them. And then um, I walked around the back of the shearing shed to have a look and, yeah, I couldn't believe my eyes. Uh, I said, no, all these lambs are sick. They're all got that um, photosynthesis, you see, because I have noticed it before in previous years. I've only ever had, you know, one or two ewes come down for now and then. And I have spoken to Colin, you know, a couple of years ago saying, what can we do about it? And he said, there's, um, it's just a fungal thing that lives in the, in the grass, you see. So... On that day, I also rang Jack Coffey from Barra. He's a local vet down there. I explained the situation. I said, I've got 122 lambs here, and the whole lot of them are just about infected with this photosynthesis. So he said, well, to make sure, show some in the back of the ute and bring them down to me to have a look. So we went and rounded them up. We put five in the ute. We shot down to Barra, which was only about 50 minutes away. And yeah, Jack only had one look at them for a minute, and he said, oh, Peter, he said, you're on a real lot of trouble with these lambs, you're going to lose a lot of them. He said they're going to need a lot of tender care and everything to try and save them. So, so they are actually my, um, yeah, my sale rants for next year. So I was quite devastated and I thought, well, we've got to try and do something. And he said, well, you know, the most important thing is to get them out of the sun so, and try and give them a shot of anti-inflammatory. So, we flew home from Barra that night, loaded up with anti-inflammatory dextrin, it was called, and a heap of nauseous and um, antibiotics. And, um, yeah, so we got home, we ran the sheep up, put them straight in the shearing shed, kept them out of the dark, and then kept them out of the sun, sorry, and then that night we moved them around to the shearing shed. Yeah, and we gave them um, three mils of dextrin and uh, four millimetres of nauseous for the... Um, infection and the pus and also 
because they had broken skin on their forehead, we found it was a good idea to give them a tetanus injection as well. So we gave them a yeah, gland bacteria and one all in the one hit. So we um, yeah, dragged them through the board and gave them all the needles and finished about half past ten or something that night. And then returned them to the, I've got a great big open head um, shearing shed. So we um, yeah, put portable sheep yards in the middle of them to keep them out of the sun and gave them plenty of fresh water with the trough and all that stuff. So. Um, yeah, it was only really the next morning I got up and looked and already all their faces were improving. You know, the swelling was already going down. Um, so we maintained and kept them in there yeah, for three days. And then we decided on that night we'd give them another round of Dexter and, and Dorsal them again. So we, yeah, after the sun went down that night, we shoot them out around the paddock and put them back through the shooting shed and gave them all another round of um, injections you see um, and then on the next day yeah I noticed that yeah, all their appetites I think was really starting to improve too they're all starting to eat and drink and um, yeah to this day that was on the um, that was on the yeah on, on the 5th of the 10th and yeah to this day as I had a look at them this afternoon now they're all improved out of sight and they're nearly ready to be um, returned to the paddock I reckon Well, that's that's great news, uh, Peter. So thank you so much for sharing that with us. And um, I'm sure there'll be questions um, that uh, attendees will have to to um, ask you. So we'll keep you on the line. Um, and now what I'll do is now, if it's okay, we'll have another uh, poll, and I'll just put it up now. And um, while we do that poll as well, um, Peter, I've got a question here about uh, what have you done with the paddock? Yeah, on, on the day that we removed the paddock, we removed the sheep from the paddock. We um, yeah, subsequently we spray top the paddock to kill the vet, and we also dropped in 200 millimetres of um, of the mat to kill all the insects. At this stage, yeah, the paddock's still just sitting there idle and we've, and we've hay freezed it. And another thing I'd like to also point out, we had 122 lambs in that paddock, and I'd say um, yeah, 119 of them were infected with yeah, this photosynthesis. Right, thank, thanks very much, Peter. Um, so thank you for that. I'll close that poll now. Um, the next uh, presenter is uh, Colin, Dr. Colin Trengove and I think you probably all um, know him uh, from his uh, vast experience and knowledge um, with ruminant animals. Um, I, I won't go through all of his uh, background because it is extensive and um, he may want to share a bit of that with you but just to get an idea of um, how uh, how experienced he is and how busy he is. Um, I noticed that he's a, um, a member of several groups, so I'll let you know now. He's a member of the Australian Veterinary Association. He's Australian Sheep Veterinarians. Um, he's a member of that group. He's also a member of the Australian Cattle Veterinarians, uh, a member of the Grassland Society of South Australia, um, the Ag Institute, the Australian Association for Ruminant Nutritionists, and the Australian Society of Animal Production. So I think he's quite qualified to um, to uh, share his knowledge with us tonight. So I'll pass over to you, um, Colin, and uh, you can go from there. Thank you, Philippa. You have been doing your homework. Rightio, so show my screen. Let's see, see if that comes up. Can everybody see that screen? Yeah. Photosensitization livestock, very good. Okay, well thank you very much. Uh, yeah, and thank you for the opportunity to uh, discuss this interesting disease uh, syndrome. So photosensitization has uh, been well recognized for many hundreds of years, but um, there's a bit more to it than meets the eye. So, uh, and as this uh, discussion tonight will reveal. Okay, so 
I'll just um, move on to my first slide here. So the description of the disease, so effectively it's uh, sensitization of uh, light colored skin to sunlight. Uh, probably not dissimilar to sunburn in the effect, but the difference is that it only requires a relatively short exposure to sun because there's a predisposing issue that's causing the problem. So it usually occurs in spring when plants are lush and green and growing rapidly, uh, but it can occur in autumn and, and different situations depending on what the particular uh, feed source that's causing the problem. And uh, as it says here, it affects uh, sheep, cattle, horses and pigs. So I've just put a couple photos there, one of um, a photo of a lamb I took many years ago back in Narracourt days, about 20 years ago, showing signs of uh, the typical eye discharge and uh, scabs uh, and serum oozing from around the, the muzzle. And also one there of a cow that I saw many years ago down near Mount Gambier, which was affected by photosensitization. Uh, with the characteristic um, scabs on the pale areas, the udder is affected and around the any white areas where the, uh, the sun really attacks the, the skin. Okay, so clinical signs. So they develop within four or five days of exposure uh, to the, the agent that causes the problem, but actually experimentally it's been shown it can develop within a number of hours once um, animals have the photodynamic agent that we're referring to. So I'll explain a bit more about that photodynamic agent, but effectively it's a chemical that remains in the bloodstream and uh, when exposed to sunlight or close to the, uh, where the blood's close to the skin surface, uh, the sun reacts with that photodynamic agent and causes a, basically a destruction of the skin and effectively it can cause death of the skin. Uh, so like a severe sunburn. It affects mainly uh, white and lightly pigmented skin. Uh, so areas such as the eyes, face, muzzle, uh, belly, uh, escutcheon, uh, teats, anywhere that uh, where there's uh, very little hair cover and, and is a pale colour or lack of pigmentation is susceptible to this problem. Uh, and where the, obviously the, the circulation is near the skin surface, which is basically the whole body. Uh, initially, uh, you'll see reddening and swelling of the exposed skin, somewhat similar to sunburn, uh, and other signs that can be present, presented is head shaking, restlessness, itchy skin, uh, and this can lead on to self-trauma, so animals either biting or chewing at their skin where they can get access to it, or rubbing against uh, posts, fences, etc., because it does begin because of the uh, itchiness of the nature of the, the syndrome. Uh, we also see drooping ears and eye, eyelids, as in the photos shown on the right, and uh, eyes and nostrils may become occluded or, or closed as a result of the severe swelling, and so it can actually make uh, breathing quite difficult. Serum oozes from the skin uh, and results in crusting and matting of the hair. And uh, as the skin tends to dry out, then it will crack, uh, as Peter referred to, and so then leads it open to uh, secondary infections, uh, which can obviously uh, make things much worse, and for that matter, even a gangrene in severe cases. Another type of variation of the syndrome can also result in, um, uh, as a result of liver damage, and so you'll also see jaundice. Uh, prostration, in other words, animals become recumbent or unable to stand, uh, and you may see death where severe cases that are left untreated or certainly in situations where liver damage is involved. The consequences results in weight loss, uh, damage to the hide and udder and teats and eyes, and obviously uh, mortalities can be an issue, uh, generally more so in sheep than in other livestock. Uh, primary photosensitization is where the uh, photodynamic agent, the chemical in the bloodstream, uh, is acquired directly from the food source. So whether it's, uh, whether it's green feed or whether it's a forage or whether it's even in some medicines. So for example, uh, carbon tetrachloride uh, and some other phenothiazine, some other chemicals have been recognized as being photodynamic. In other words, once they're in the bloodstream and the animal's exposed to sunlight, we can get this uh, uh, skin damage as a result. So examples of uh, primary photosensitization agents, so St. John's wort is um, a weed that's um, well recognized as being associated with it, and that's got a particular chemical called hypericin, uh, which has been recognized as the photodynamic agent. 
that um, sets up the uh, photosensitization. But we've also seen it uh, associated with uh, grazing lucerne and vetch is obviously the question is in this particular scenario, uh, but also clovers, uh, brassicas so such as rape and kale, uh, plantain, uh, perennial ryegrass, storksbill or rhodium species or which sometimes we know as uh, geranium, wild geranium. Uh, Japanese millet, for example, and uh, and as a more of a generic circumstance, is this issue with uh, aphids affecting legumes. So whether that's uh, medics uh, or lucerne or vetch or a variety of other possibilities, some of the burr medics, etc. And so this illustration out of a uh, um, primary industries fact sheet uh, just shows here the adult aphid and. Uh, Oops, just go back one more, uh, and also the nipple stages, so the um, which uh, you may see one or other in, in a particular case, and uh, obviously they need to be there in numbers before we'd be consider them to be a significant issue. There's also another type of photosensitization referred to as secondary, and this is associated with liver disease or liver injury, and so there may be a primary toxin causing liver injury, and so the chlorophyll uh, well, the phyloerythrin, which is a, a, a metabolic product of chlorophyll, in other words, the green pigment in grass, so it's converted into phyloerythrin, and this is normally uh, excreted out of the body if you've got a normal functioning liver. But if we have a damaged liver, and so, for example, the bile ducts are blocked, uh, instead of being excreted, this uh, phyloerythrin remains in the bloodstream, and so that acts as the photodynamic agent which interacts with the sun and, and causes the, the skin lesions that we uh, are familiar with. Can I just interrupt so there for a minute? Are... Sorry, Colin. Um, we've got sure, a few yep. questions that have coming in. Um, uh, initially in your earlier slides, was there, um, did any of those uh, sheep lo end up losing their ears? Uh, can do, yes. Yeah, so the uh, damage it can be quite severe, especially in, in, I guess, thin areas such as the ears. And so those uh, can certainly just shrivel up and, and drop off because the, um, the chemical reaction to the sun and the photodynamic agent yeah, will cause severe skin damage and, and death of that tissue. Okay. And um, there's another one that's come in. Uh, were there any that didn't receive injections? Uh, yeah, so that's a case of where if the animals are recognised as having the problem removed from the offending paddock or pasture, uh, they can relatively quickly recover. So it just really comes back to the degree of damage done before the animals are retrieved or, or removed from the offending area. So they don't necessarily need to be treated with um, the various products that uh, Peter mentioned, but if, uh, if they are severely affected, well, the products will certainly help them uh, recover more quickly. And I'll okay. explain that a bit later on. Sure. And we've got one that says, what about swollen heads? I looked um, like crossbred rams. Yep. Yep. So I've, I've certainly seen that syndrome with, um, for example, Japanese millet many years ago, once again down around in, in Narracourt. The um, swollen heads, so yeah, effectively you just get a lot of uh, inflammation uh, as a re and fluid accumulation around the head as a result of the... Um, the agent or the chemical in the blood uh, interacting with the sun and so it's just like a yeah a really severe sunburn and uh, th that um, can resolve with time but um, probably the more severe the swelling the more likelihood you're going to get a better response by treating with uh, corticosteroids in other words anti-inflammatory products. Yeah, and it might so, be worth uh, mentioning, plus, plus. Uh, sorry Colin, it, Peter's yeah. uh, just uh, mentioned there that uh, he had injected anti-inflammatory um, in the sheep and only penicillin were the ones uh, that had the um, pus and broken skin. Yes, that's right. So if, uh, and once again it depends on how severe the situation is, if you do get um, leathery skin that's cracking, uh, certainly a penicillin or an antibiotic um, cover would be a good idea to prevent secondary bacterial infection and so a lot of pus formation etc. But if it's um, a relatively mild case where it might only be say the, um, the ears affected, well you probably don't need to use the antibiotic. Um, but more just to get them into shade. So no, getting them into shade is number one. Getting them away from the sun and that chemical that's circulating in the bloodstream will, you know, will eventually pass out of the body. So uh, if they're not getting ongoing exposure to sun, well, they should recover pretty quickly. 
Okay, well, I have one more and then we'll, we've got plenty of questions coming in, which is fantastic. Um, so, um, I've had rams with severely swollen testes. They Will they recover and how long may this take and what effect on sperm production? Oh, yeah, that's getting complicated. Um, so, when you've got fluid accumulation, so obviously um, the purse, the the uh, scrotum is, uh, can be exposed to sunlight like any other part of the body and, uh, and not having a lot of wool cover uh, can be quite susceptible to photosensitisation uh, and once again the inflammatory reaction means you'll get fluid accumulation especially in a dependent area like that, in other words on the lower part of the body fluid tends to flow to those areas uh, and my concern would be that it may, it could certainly cause temporary infertility uh, and, I, and one of the issues would be if it's um, differentiating or, or making sure it is actually photosensitisation and not an orchitis, which is a, basically an infection in the, uh, in the scrotum or the testicle in particular. Uh, but if you get fluid accumulation there, that will certainly reduce the ability to regulate temperature of the testicles and so um, semen production may be compromised. And normally you'd expect uh, any inflammatory process in the scrotum can easily render those animals infertile for a couple months because it takes a couple months for new semen to be developed. So if there's a temperature rise, which is not necessarily the case with photosensitization, but if the body temperature is that does rise a degree or two, that could be enough to cook all the semen in the um, testicles and so they may be not infertile for the next two months until the, um, they basically, well, assuming they recover from the uh, photosensitization quickly, uh, it still could be at least another two months before they'll have viable semen produced. Right, okay. So well, the, yeah, that is yeah. quite a concern. Yeah, yeah, it certainly sounds like it. No one likes to cook testes. Um, we'll we'll get back to you now, Colin, in your um and your presentation, and we'll we'll uh, answer a few more questions after you're finished. Righty, -oh. so uh, just going on with this uh, secondary cause of photosensitisation. So this is where there's been liver injury, and that's certainly uh, it's not uncommon. Uh, examples would be um, poisonings due to uh, blue green algae. Uh, which obviously tends to be more a, a summertime issue when we've had thunderstorms and, and so uh, uh, dams, etc., streams have become contaminated with uh, either fertiliser or, or um, faecal matter. Uh, lupins, lupinosis, which is obviously a fungal infection in the lupin stubble in summertime. Uh, cowtrop, which tends to be more of a, a summer growing weed anyway, but uh, that is certainly recognised as causing uh, liver damage and so predisposing to photosensitisation. And even panic grass, um, so that was a bit of a problem uh, back in the uh, earlier in the um, winter period and these photos here will illustrate an example I looked at um, not far from New York, uh, where we see here the typical um, the pink um, fresh tissue around the eyes and, and, and nose muzzle uh, associated with the uh, photosensitization. So once again interaction with the, um, in this case the phyloerythrin, the, uh, the breakdown product of uh, the green pigment in grass which has remained in the blood circulation, interacted with the sun and caused this um, photosensitising effect around the eyes and, and nose. And uh, we see here that um, close up of the uh, conjunctiva in the eyeball, we see here it's quite yellow, indicating um, jaundice, which is uh, indicative of uh, liver damage in this case. And then we over, over here just see where they opened up this uh, particular dead animal and found that it was uh, very jaundiced, in other words, the yellow pigment throughout the body, uh, highlighting the fact that um, yeah, there's obviously a severe liver damage going on here. And that was associated in this case with panic grass, but we see that with, we can see it with Salvation Jane, with um, common heliotrope or potato weed, with cowtrop, uh, lupinosis, blue-green algae. So there's a number of different issues where we have a, I guess the primary problem is uh, damage to the liver and then the secondary effect is animals that are grazing any green feed at the time uh, have, a, have this phyloerythrin uh, accumulating in the bloodstream instead of being excreted through the, uh, the normal, normal functioning liver. Okay, so uh, we've talked about primary photosensitization, which is really what the problem is uh, we're currently experiencing with uh, vetch and aphid infestation. Uh, there's a secondary issue which is another, can occur quite commonly depending on time of the year. Uh, and then there's a third case where it's an inherited form or, some, or possibly an acquired defect where the porphyrin uh, metabolism doesn't occur normally. And so porphyrin is, is once again that phyloerythrin 
chemical which is normally excreted, metabolised and excreted, but um, if there's an inherited defect in the animal that can remain in the circulation. And so this illustration here of the animals with uh, all their extremities quite pink and sun, well, photosensitised. I keep wanting to say sunburnt because it looks like sunburn, but um, uh, that's the case where um, there's a, a def uh, defect in the uh, porphyrin metabolism in the animal. So a bit more about aphids and photosensitisation. So this has uh, been a revelation to most of us, I think, in that um, most people were unaware of aphids uh, potentially causing photosensitisation. And even when I spoke to Peter the first time, I was suspecting that it was a secondary to a liver injury, but um, as it turns out, not the case. And so uh, research reveals that uh, this was first reported in horses in Germany in 1841. And interestingly enough, this is when they were preparing horses for um, uh, adding to the military uh, ranks. And uh, they had a whole lot of uh, grey and white horses uh, break down with photosensitisation. And it was noted at the time that they'd been feeding an aphid infested vetch. And uh, and so the, um, there's been a lot more information found out since then. Even in the early 1900s in Australia, there was a as well recognised syndrome, especially in New South Wales, that I, that um, uh, produces called aphis disease, and uh, that was associated primarily with grazing uh, burr clover or burr medic, which is another medicargo uh, species. And it was found at the time that aphids uh, in, that infested these particular uh, pastures were contained a fluorescent aphid pigment uh, that's photodynamic, uh, similar to uh, hyperpericin, hyper, hyperericin in uh, St John's Wort. And so it's been recognised since the early 1900s that um, aphids do have a photodynamic agent that can predispose to photosensitisation. Another report uh, from Spain in, in 2007 uh, where 450 uh, hoggets and adult sheep out of 1,100 were affected and another case where there's 150 out of 750 affected, so relatively high uh, prevalences. They were grazing lucerne at the time that was heavily infested with uh, cow pea uh, aphid and, uh, and also with ladybirds. And uh, what they did then, they actually uh, then did some trial work where they um, basically shore the uh, sheep close to the skin, uh, normal sheep and ground up the uh, ladybirds and injected them into the skin and found that uh, these, uh, the erytheme or the, the uh, reddening and swelling and inflammation uh, started to develop within about two or three hours of being exposed to sunlight. So they concluded at the time that it was possibly more like the other ladybirds rather than the aphids that were causing the problem. But um, And they said more research needs to be done. Now, I think more, more the case it was the fact the ladybirds had eaten aphids which had the photodynamic agent and, uh, and so it's interesting how you can draw some strange conclusions um, if you don't look into things too closely. But um, So once again the uh, aphids were the issue and it was interesting that suckling lambs were unaffected and that just highlights the fact that the lambs weren't being exposed to the photodynamic agent um, unlike their um, the ewes that were obviously grazing uh, aphid infected pasture. And the slides down the bottom here are illustrations from that particular journal where we see the typical uh, swelling around the eyes and jaw, so quite tight skin and that would be quite painful. Um, anyone who's had swollen uh, skin knows how painful that can be. And the uh, reddening of the udder, so photosensitisation occurring here. And then the slide here on the right showing a heavy infestation of aphids in that uh, particular stand of lucin. Okay, so what do we differentiate, only, uh, differentiate uh, photosensitization from? So other diseases which may appear similar at times, uh, there's uh, dermo or lumpy wool, mycotic dermatitis, where we can see these uh, distinct lesions on the uh, muzzle and uh, also the, uh, and because in this case it's, a, it's an internal effect of this particular organism, you get a lot of serum released under the wool and so you get this very lumpy wool appearance which is not something you'd characteristically see with um, photosensitisation. Plus you don't tend to get a lot of swelling around the face, you just get these distinct um, nodules uh, and a bit of, uh, and where you've got skin injury they get knocked off. So next we see uh, scabby mouth. So this has also been uh, sometimes confused with photosensitisation because we do get these crusty 
uh, lesions, uh, scabs around the mouth, uh, which can be quite nasty. And obviously, debilitating for the animal makes it very difficult to eat, especially if they're on a hard feed. Uh, but characteristically, these lesions or scabs are generally just around the mouth and lips uh, and occasionally around the feet. But you don't tend to get that swelling of the ears and, and general swelling of the face. Uh, cobalt deficiency sometimes shows up with this scaliness around the ears uh, and this is also maybe associated sometimes with a bit of liver injury. Uh, in fact, it's called uh, white liver disease. But um, so scaliness is usually just that scaliness around the ears and sometimes obviously the animals become ill thrifty because it does impair their appetite and so they, they tend to uh, lose vigour or become ill thrifty as a result of their loss of appetite. Uh, but you don't tend to get the swelling uh, like we do see with photosensitization. Uh, and a final uh, condition here is uh, people see from time to time where it may be associated with some poron products or some other chemical uh, damage to the hide which uh, results in wool loss um, and sometimes the skin can get quite leathery uh, and obviously um, open wounds develop but that tends to have a distinct pattern associated with a particular chemical that may have been used. So it might have been a, a lousicide or a, a dipping agent which has caused, been associated once again, it's caused a bit of uh, damage to the skin and resulted in a, in a sunburn effect. So diagnosing the condition, generally uh, looking at the grazing history, what time of the year it is, what's the seasonal prevailing seasonal conditions been that uh, might predispose to um, particular species causing problems. Uh, what's the feed type? How long has it gone on for? Uh, and is there a uh, aphid infestation associated with the uh, the pasture in question? We also obviously look at clinical signs, and generally um, most diagnoses would be based purely on clinical signs. Uh, and as we've just explained, um, the other diseases that you may confuse it with. Uh, but the skin lesions have a distinctive appearance and distribution around all the um, the pale, non-pigmented areas of the body that aren't covered in as a heavy uh, length of wool or hair and uh, associated with uh, obviously grazing a susceptible species. And the final point here is a blood test. Now blood tests generally aren't very useful for a primary photosensitization. So for example, if it is a, uh, for example, an aphid infestation in vetch, the blood tests are going to come back relatively normal. But if there is any uh, liver damage as a result of, uh, in other words, the secondary photosensitization sensitization form, uh, there will be evidence of um, elevated liver enzymes and they can be quite uh, distinctive and diagnostic. There is also the opportunity to actually do a blood test looking at the photodynamic agent, but that's not generally readily available and, uh, and would probably prove quite expensive, so I haven't listed that here. So if just finishing up on treatment, uh, and so removing the uh, stock obviously from the offending forage or feed or paddock, um, reducing protein in the t intake in the case of where it's associated with liver damage, but uh, with primary photosensitization where there's no liver damage, uh, we don't need to worry about that particular aspect. Uh, and as Peter has already referred to, providing shade and obviously putting them into a shed uh, a la like uh, what Peter has done is the ideal so they don't have any access to sunlight uh, or otherwise um, you know, a dense wooded area that um, they can hopefully, because uh, they will seek shade if they get an opportunity and generally uh, kept out of the sun for a week or so, they should be uh, fairly well back to normal uh, as uh, Peter has highlighted in his uh, experience. The, uh, with animals that are more severely affected, so where there is a, a, like a shock syndrome and some toxemia and possibly infection involved, well that's where we do recommend uh, early use of antihistamines can, can be an advantage. Certainly the use of anti-inflammatories and so cortisone or dexasone, uh, corticosteroids that are, generally have a, a medium to long term benefit are certainly recommended and they'll reduce that swelling of uh, every part of the body that might be swollen, whether it's the testicles or whether it's the face or head, uh, that reduction in that inflammatory response, getting rid of the fluid, will certainly improve the skin healing uh, much more quickly. And uh, use of antibiotics where the skin has been significantly damaged, so where there's any cracking, the leathers, the skin has gone leather-like or certainly uh, is sloughing off or has died, uh, obviously antibiotics are going to be a, a big advantage in that circumstance. Uh, prognosis, in other words, how quickly they recover will depend entirely on how soon they are uh, removed from the offending forage uh, and how quickly or how um, 
severe the damage is. So the longer, sooner you can recognise the problem and get them off, the better. So my final slide here, uh, prevention. So avoiding access to susceptible pasture species in spring. Now, obviously, uh, in this case, aphids and uh, cowpea, uh, cowpea aphid and uh, vetch, or any other medic for that matter, um, is not a regular occurrence, and so it's more associated probably with uh, dry conditions uh, where the plants have become more susceptible or vulnerable to um, aphid attack, and so that's uh, a bit circumstantial. So it's not going to be necessarily an issue from year to year. Uh, so strategic management to prevent or minimise aphid infestations, and, and I'll, I'll allow uh, Kim to expand on that part of it. Uh, and the other idea is, as always, you should always be monitoring livestock on a, on a regular basis, uh, especially during that late winter, early spring period to detect and if there's any evidence of um, photosensitisation occurring and moving them to shelter as early as signs develop. And uh, Peter did also highlight the fact that um, obviously another consequence can be fly strike and, uh, and so certainly that's another issue that needs to be uh, kept in mind. He also mentioned the um, possibility of tetanus developing and so wherever you've got fissures or cracks in the skin that does open up that opportunity so uh, generally people would hopefully have a tetanus cover through the use of um, you know three and one or five and one as a routine anyway so I'll finish up there thanks Philippa Thanks, Colin. We've got a few more questions that have come in. Um, one is uh, should you keep the wool on affected sheep until it's until they're cured? Yeah, look, I certainly wouldn't be shearing animals that have been recently affected by photo uh, sensitisation. I think the uh, yeah wool cover would be a good idea, uh, and until at least um, I'd probably say give them at least a couple of weeks after they've um, been removed from any uh, offending pastures, uh, and and when the skin's looking healthy again, then probably subject them to, to shearing. Also, the fact that they're going to be um, probably much more vulnerable to um, any stressful activity and, and shearing is certainly recognised as a stressful activity for both the, you know, the, the sheep and the people working with them. So um, minimising stress for animals that are recovering from a photosensitisation would be a good idea. No, oh, that's great. Thank you, Colin. Um, and another one that's come in, uh, do all aphids contain the photodynamic agent or is it just cowpea aphids? That might be one Look for Kim too. Yeah, look, the uh, the literature suggests that it's only the cowpea aphid, and interestingly enough, those uh, cases uh, from out of the literature um, were all associated with the cowpea aphid, uh, even though it wasn't necessarily called cowpea aphid back in the 1840s or, for that matter, in the early 1900s. Uh, but it's the same uh, genus and species as what we now know, now call the cowpea aphid. Great. Uh, and perhaps. Uh, Kim, Kim might better expand a bit more on the variety of aphids that are in the environment. Yeah, I'm sure. Um, and we've got another one that's come in from um, uh, another industry professional that says um, that uh, she's seen some of the issues on EP that have also been in, in medic pastures. So that's right. Yeah. Mm. Yep. Okay. Yeah, so that's, that's, that's right. There's a variety of, well, Lucin, uh, yeah, Burr Medic, uh, Vetch, uh, and obviously cow peas, um, there's, yeah, there's a whole host of different legumes which uh, appear to be obviously affected. So I, I gather that the cow pea aphid is not very um, particular in, in what it tends to infest. Uh, but it does, it would appear that um, perhaps crops that are under stress are obviously the, the most likely to be attacked by the aphid. Uh, and so whether that's a moisture stress or a um, nutritional stress, um, that might be a, a better one for agronomists to, to answer. And this one might sort of lead in with that one a bit too. Uh, is there a maximum temperature for the cow pea aphids, as in with hot weather coming? I know that um, uh, certainly once again in the literature it was suggested there where you have uh, significant rainfall, that tends to um, remove them as a pest. But in terms of uh, sensitivity to hot weather, I'm not so sure. That might be something that uh, Kim could answer. Okay, and this one's uh, this one's probably more directed at you too. Um, that uh, this attendee is uh, a narrow court person who's um, noticed some cattle uh, grazing on loosen stands, developing signs. Um, so uh, yeah, I guess that's the thing. Is it's um, yep able to be to be in loosen um, as well. And uh, so, what are your thoughts on that one, Colin? 
Yeah, well, certainly, um, uh, as I said at the start, the um, you know, pigs, cattle, horses, sheep are all susceptible, and probably for that matter, goats and alpacas. And uh, I would suspect it just comes back to dose, dose dependence. So if you've got um, uh, insect damage occurring in lucerne and uh, cattle are eating enough of it, I imagine the same issue applies. Um, and when I say insect damage, I should specify uh, you know, this cow P. aphid um, because, because it's got this particular chemical um, in its makeup, um, you know, potentially if they're consumed in large enough numbers, it'll cause problems. Yeah, great. And I'll have one more before I hand over to Kim. Um, how many aphids do the sheep need to eat to have issues? <laughs> how long is a piece of string? <laughs> yeah. Look, uh, I, I read the um, the Saudi or, or Persa fact sheet on cowpea aphid uh, and it listed there some of the uh, thresholds for when you should look at uh, treatment and, and perhaps this is better for Peter to answer but um, I think for example in some crops it said if you've got a third of the um, the heads or the flowers affected and you've got more than 30 aphids on a on a flower then you know, potentially there's an issue there that needs to be dealt with but um, they, a lot of the species we talked about and vetch being one of them um, didn't have a threshold, threshold listed so yeah it is a bit of a case of how long is a piece of string and it's um, a, your uh, aversion to risk if you're seeing problems in the livestock well it's probably worth dealing with them but um, before that it's hard to say. Yeah, no, fine. Good, thank you. Well, um, with that, I'll just put up our uh, one more poll um, and uh, just so we can get shed some light on, on where people are seeing uh, these issues. So, um, so I better th throw back yes, to you, but no. Yes, yes please. Uh, have you got the screen back? Uh, no. Change presenter. Oh, here no, we go. I'll just see if I can override you. Uh, no, it should be. Yep, no, it's good. Right. I'm good. Thank mm -hmm. you very much. Um, so we'll go into one more poll, um, which I'll launch now. So if you could, uh, yeah, have a look at that and and um, answer appropriately. Great, I think we've got just about all of those votes in now. I'll just leave it up for a little minute while I introduce Kim anyway. Um, so Kim Perry is an entomologist from Saudi, from, from Persa, um, and uh, he's actually part of the research team of scientists that are um, integrating pest management with biosecurity programs, um, specifically for the ag sectors. Um, so he is also part of the group that provides the pest fact bulletins which um, a lot of you probably uh, subscribe to. So um, so I'll hand over to Kim and he can uh, um, yeah, shed some light on, on things from his point of view. Thanks Kim. All right, thank you Philippa uh, and thanks for the opportunity. I'm not actually seeing the slides on my uh, screen. Oh, here we go. Excellent. So uh, I have to say this is a, this is a new issue to me, um, and certainly a lot of my entomologist colleagues. We haven't really dealt with uh, an issue with livestock before, so um, in terms of the livestock impacts, uh, certainly this is a learning experience for us. But hopefully, we can provide some uh, information around control. So, Philippa, do I have access to my own slides, or are you working those for me? I can sort those for you. Righto, let's go. Oops. Yes, we've got a bit too carried away. There we go. Okay, so as Peter's, um, uh, sorry, Collins mentioned, the cowpea aphid is the uh, the source of the concern here. Uh, there, there are around four or five different pest aphids that we uh, we have in our cropping systems, and in the legume crops in particular, cowpea aphid is certainly probably the most abundant aphid. We also see blue-green aphid and, uh, and pea aphid attacking crops, but cowpea aphid are pretty easy to identify. They're, you know, they're the only black aphid you'll find on your pulse crops. Now, it's in terms of 
their uh, preferences for environmental conditions. The cowpea aphid is probably the one that does best under warmer conditions. And in the autumn, it's often the aphid that you'll see first colonising your uh, vetch and other legume crops. So they're a continuously breeding species. And so they, they won't go into diapause, but typically their populations will crash over summer because the host plants dry off. And the aphids tend to disperse across the landscape looking for non-crop legume hosts. And so they generally survive in low numbers over the summer. And you'll start to see them colonising uh, crops and pastures typically in autumn. And as I mentioned, the cowpea aphid is usually the first one you'll see. Now we certainly had a really, really dry start at the beginning of this season. And it's possible that um, those conditions were, were particularly suitable for this, this aphid. And it's likely to be one of the reasons we've got such high numbers this spring. Now I've had some phone calls about uh, the, the cowpea aphid over the last couple of weeks, unsurprisingly. And as I said, as entomologists, we've had very little experience with impacts on livestock and don't understand the cause of it. So I was talking to um, a couple of vets within Persa, and one of the photographs I got, got sent by a producer was um, he noticed that there was a, a resin underneath the plants which had a bit of a black film on it. And I took a look and I thought, I know what that is. That's sooty mould. So what happens is the, the aphids will secrete a honeydew solution. And if there are high densities, uh, sooty, sooty mould can then grow on the honeydew residue. And um, not knowing much about livestock impacts, I did a little bit of um, quick internet research and discovered that certain fungi and fungal toxins can have impacts on stock. And so I wondered if potentially there are some fungi within the sooty mould produced as a secondary effect of aphid infestation. So as a result of that, um, uh, one of the vets I was talking to, Jeremy Rogers, has arranged to get some samples of uh, the sooty mould analysed to see if there are potentially some mycotoxins involved. Uh, so that'll have to play out. We'll see what happens. Now, in terms of control of the aphid this season, Philippa, if you could just change the slide. Uh, it's not very complicated. Essentially, there are, in fact, go to the next slide, um, please, Philippa. It's, a ba it's basically down to a choice of insecticides, and the options are actually fairly limited. Uh, I spent a number of hours today screening through various products, reading insecticide labels. It's, qu it's quite difficult to find a product registered for cowpea aphid in vetch. Now, so what I've done here, in South Australia, the legislation allows us, or growers, to use an insecticide in a crop um, as long as it's registered for an insect pest in that crop. So essentially, there are no insecticides registered specifically for cowpea aphid in virtual medic. So I've listed the ones here that are likely to work against the aphids and are able to be used in those crops. So looking at medic crops, uh, we have perimicarb, uh, which is the insecticide, and example products include aphidex and pyramor, and there are some others. Uh, and you'll see that there are, there are rates uh, recommended there. Typically, perimicarb needs to be used under warmer conditions. Now, perimicarb is uh, probably the first choice, although it's not the cheapest insecticide because it is specific to, aph to aphids. It won't kill natural enemies. So in crops, there are a lot of predatory and parasitic insects which will attack aphids and, and reduce their populations, as I'll talk about in a minute. So where possible, keeping those around is a good thing because they provide free control. All of the other insecticides listed there are essentially very broad spectrum. So your group 1Bs, are all your organophosphates, and your group 3As are all your synthetic pyrethroids. And those chemistries will, um, they're essentially contact chemistries. They will kill aphids. They'll also kill um, everything else there, including natural enemies. So that's fine. Um, we're obviously in a fairly unusual situation where we do need to achieve uh, good control and, and quickly. So um, you know what has to be done has to be done. 
So what, what I'll, rem I mean, I'm not a chemical reseller per se, so I would certainly uh, recommend talking to chemical resellers and taking their advice on products. Um, certainly, this is my attempt to, um, to give everyone a start on the information, but certainly check it yourself. Now, Philippa, if you could flick back to the previous slide. So I'll uh, reiterate that it's very important to read the product labels carefully. For aphids are a tricky insect because the, what they do is um, in, inject their mouth parts into the plant and essentially feed on the phloem. They occur in high densities and, and can occur underneath leaves. And so it's very important to achieve good spray coverage. And we'd recommend using you know, at least 80 to 120 litres of water with probably medium droplet sizes. Now, because we're talking grazing, we need to be very mindful of uh, withholding periods around grazing, uh, particularly if you're looking to export uh, your sheep. So again, read the product labels carefully. The Safe Meat website is a pretty good resource. Uh, I rang them up about this issue today. <laughs> they put me onto the APVMA. Uh, Philippa, if you could just flick to the next slide. And the APVMA have told me that essentially your uh, export slaughter intervals and export grazing intervals uh, should be on the product labels if there are any relevant to those chemistries. So um, again, check the labels very carefully uh, and, uh, and you should be right. All right, and the final comments I'll make on aphid control is that uh, typically late, as you approach late spring and crops start to dry off, aphid populations will certainly decline. They rely on actively growing plants for population growth and as soon as the crops become unsuitable, aphids have a, a habit of disappearing very, very rapidly. So um, you may need to spray but it's also worth having a look at the aphid population. If you don't see, or if you do see lots and lots of little, tiny little nymph aphids there, it suggests that the population may still be expanding. But if you're only seeing uh, hardly any small ones and mostly big ones, it's an indication that the population may be um, stable or, or about to crash. And also keep an eye out for things like lady beetles uh, and other predators. Once you start seeing lots of those, it's usually not very long before aphids will disappear. Thanks, Kim. I've okay, got some questions coming. Sorry. Questions coming in for you? Yeah, no, look, I'm pretty much there. I'm happy to take questions. Yeah. Okay, so we've got Go um, do the sheep ingest the aphids as a whole bug or do they ingest a secretion from the aphids that contains the photosensitive agent? Uh, sorry, can, can you repeat that, Philip? Do the sheep ingest the aphids as a whole bug or do they ingest a secretion from the aphids that contains I... the photosensitive agent? Oh, I would be the whole aphid. If they're eating the plants, they'd be eating the aphids. But I have to say, I know nothing about the photosense, photo uh, dynamic agent with aphids. But certainly, I would suspect that the aphids themselves are being consumed. Okay. Um, uh, I've got a comment here from Peter. Peter um, commented that LEMAT is also registered. Um, I've checked the registrations. The, the, the registrations for LEMAT are methylate. Uh, are actually becoming more restricted and that's now only registered as a border treatment for red-legged earth mite and not in, not in South Australia. So New South Wales and Western Australia are registered um, in SA. I, I know people still have a methylate on hand. I, as a government representative, I can't recommend, recommend it be used. Great. All right. Thank you. Well, I'm very uh, aware of the fact that we've actually run over time, but it's yeah so interesting. It's it's easy to do. Um, look, thank you very much, uh, all of you, for your attendance, um, and a special thank you to our our guest speakers. Um, so, uh, if uh, what will happen now is that um, we'll have a, a, a survey just to so you can let us know whether you think this was informative or not and so we can head in the right direction for next time. Um, and uh, you'll also receive uh, an email um, with a link to the recording and it will also have all the, um, the slideshows and, and that sort of thing too. So um, 
so you can all uh, uh, look back over it um, and and check on the um, vast amounts of information that we've just received. So thanks again, and um, and hopefully uh, you'll uh, join into our our next webinar. Thanks very much. <laughs>